Welcome to the Harwood Hustle powered by PGC Basketball. We believe in the value of a coach. We're here to educate, empower, and encourage you to lead like never before. This week, Sam welcomes head coach John Baines to the show to talk X's and O's. Coach Baines is entering his 10th season as the head coach at Elmhurst University after making a run to the national championship game last season. In this episode, they talk playing fast, rebounding strategies, practice drills, and much more. Let's get started. All right, welcome back to the Hardwood Hustle. Sam Allen here and joined by special guest, Elmhurst College head coach, John Baines. John, welcome to the hustle. Thank you. Great to have me on. Well, look, you know, I want to start off here, which is, you know, you won a national championship as a player. And, you know, sometimes or a lot of times our playing experience shapes our early years of coaching and who we played for. We either coach how we were coached or maybe we go a completely opposite direction of how we were coached because of a certain way we were coached. So just tell us a little bit about, you know, how your playing experience in college shaped and and the experience of winning a national championship. Um, And you just are fresh off playing in a national championship as a coach and, and becoming runner up. So just tell us a little bit about that and your transition, your early years of coaching. Yeah, I, I was really fortunate. I played for a really uh, Hall of Fame high school coach in Illinois, Cal Hubbard, and and then uh, went to college and played for, for Denny Bridges, and he won over 700 games in college. And so uh, I feel like I was – not every person has that experience where they get to, to play underneath somebody that good. And uh, I feel like that really shaped me as a coach. You know, people – I often get, you know, John, you, you're not – uh, your demeanor on the side sideline is is kind of calm, and I said, "Well, you know, I played for two really calm guys, and I think that that's and it's my personality anyway." But I think that that's really shaped me. But uh, yeah, going back to the Final Four after 25 years, that was a really surreal moment for me because uh, it was such a it's such a different experience as a coach than it is as a player. You know, as a player. Um, you're, as a coach, you're excited, but as a player, you're just fun, you're ready to play, and, and we're just going to get out there and we're going to do it. And as a coach, you just think about all the things, boy, how you know how are we uh, going to try to put it all together? But um, no, it was it was a great experience, and uh, for me, and I think as a coach, that first the the coaching I had leading up to it, I think has shaped me even you know 25 years later. Yeah, and you know, speaking of making Final Four national championship game. You know, now that you you go there, it helps validate and re, maybe reinforce you know what you're doing as a coach. And you guys have had success leading up to you know this past year. But is there anything now reflecting you know a few months later, uh, having been there and tasted it a little bit? Is there anything that that any epiphany, any realization, or is it kind of like nope? You know, we just we put on our shoes the next day and we we're going to stay with what we've been doing or is there any new realizations like i said or epiphanies uh you know it's funny i a little bit you know i i think as a coach you're always growing and and i uh that i i heard the the comment that that self want wearing this is the superpower and i think that that's awesome you know it's a I think I, I'm 46 years old and I've been doing this a while and I don't know everything. I'm still learning. I'm still thinking about how I can be a better coach. Uh, but I, I think I know who I am now and I know what uh, what our program brings to people. You know, we, we went back it was probably about five years ago and, and our, my assistant and I, Peyton Wyatt, and I said, you know, I know what we sell. I know what we're doing here. I think the players know what we're doing here, but we're not packaging this very well. I said, we don't really have a brand, you know, and, and, and who are, who are we? And, and so we went back and said, Hey, you know, we're a relationship driven program. And I, and I'm a guy who desires to be a one percenter and um, that's what we are. And that's what you're, you're, you're going to get that when you come here. And I think doing that and going through that process, I think for me made us, made me more self-aware of who I was and what we were doing. And so when you ask about like, you know, um, what, what this is, I don't think it was a fluke. I think we now we, we have good players. We know what we're doing. Um, you know, that doesn't mean we I mean, have to have some lucky breaks in that tournament. I mean, we won a couple, an overtime game and a, and a game at the buzzer. I mean, but I, I know what we're doing is good 
and our program is is in a good spot. And so for me, I, I'm I'm happy with that. Yeah, I love hearing that. You know, you said relationships, and you know, it, yeah, sometimes comes to a to a head with everything working together. But a big part of your success, John, and you know, is y'all style of play. And we talked about some of this pre-show, and you guys want to play really fast. So let's talk about your your offensive concepts and your transition game. What? How do you approach it as a coach? Yeah, I mean, everybody says they want to play fast until they have to play fast. I always laugh. That, you know, coach, we I want to get up and down, and about two minutes in, they're like, I'm gassed, and uh, can we walk the ball off the floor? But uh, you know, I think as a coach, you just have to make a decision on. Um, you know, are you going to run after makes? Are you going to run after misses? Or, or how many guys are you sitting in the glass? And all those things, and a lot of that stuff is uh, determined by your by your personnel. And and I think, um, you know, I think when you, especially at the college level, you, you have two ways of going. You have a system, and you recruit to a system. Or you know, for our level, you, you're just trying to get good players, and then you adjust to what your talent level looks like and what your personnel looks like. And I felt like a a while back, we realized that we were getting a little bit more athletic. Um, we kind of wanted to throw a curveball in a fastball league. Um, you know, the Midwest and, and our our D3 uh, conference is one of the best in the nation. And uh, it was a lot like the Big Ten. It's a, lot, it's a bunch of guys beating up on each other. Everybody plays man and just comes and they go. And we said, you know, let's let's see if we can do something a little different. And uh, we went, we had a trip to Spain. Um, and took a foreign trip and we got to uh, you got to we got to fiddle with some things that uh, didn't count I guess you would say you know you don't care if you win those games or lose those games and that was really good for us because we found some things that we really liked and so that's kind of morphed into how we've become this transition team Um, you know and uh, and the guys like it you know the guys have bought into it and I think that with any system that's what it is you know the guys have to say you know this is a good way to play and we want to do it this way and so they've they've really embraced it yeah I I like what you said you play it be a curveball in a fastball league and we had Tony Bennett on on here uh, not too long ago and when he joined the ACC and you know talking about being a curveball they they played their pack line and you know, their mover blocker offense and kind of more methodical. And, and so it's just different. And so I like that. Let's get into some of the, you know, tangible things y'all do. So when you, when you get out in transition, are you, is it, you know, filling corners? Is it running rim runner? Do you have your two and your three running certain sides or is it um, more positionless in your approach? Yeah, I, we would say it's positionless. So, you know, we do a kind of a build up if you can kind of envision it's, um, you know, we, part of it starts with your fundamental work. You know, we do a lot of two feet stuff. You know, I think a lot of people do the Villanova stuff and, and that sort of thing. So we do a lot of that. But we play one on one full court and two on two full court where you're throwing it up the sides and then you're boomeranging it back and the guy gets in the lane. And um, so we're we're doing that with everybody one through five, you know, so they're having to handle the ball. Guys can take it. Um, I did feel like this. I think over the years I felt I used to run the the secondary transition and everything. And what I felt like that ended up being was um, we're running half court offense, getting to it quickly, you know, and guys were just running to spots. And I felt like when I took that away and we just got out and we got the ball up and we said, get paint touches and get in the lane. And I, you know, you got to give them some freedom when you do this, you say, Hey, if you get in the paint and you can score, do it. You know, if if you can get in the paint, you kick it for a three and the guy's wide open, you got to, you know, I'm willing to let that guy shoot it. You know, now we got to get in the paint first because I want to have the rebounding and all that sort of thing. But um, it, it's kind of it's positionless. It's getting guys to just get out and go. Uh, one thing that we've done that's been really good for us is uh, the 15 second shot clock. So if we're, we're playing three trips, if we're playing, uh, we go down and you have a you know a thirty second shot clock. On the second trip back, you go fifteen seconds. And I don't want guys just jacking up stuff. You know, when we say we play fast, it's not like uh, hey, we got to get this many shots up. It's not one of those. We we run offense. But if you can't get a good shot in fifteen seconds, you get the ball baseline out of bounds or side out of bounds with fifteen seconds. So we put another fifteen up there, and then we go the third trip down, and same deal. It's fifteen seconds. Well. Guys don't want to run baseline out of bounds over and over and over again. So they really get out and run and they try to go. And um, I think it's kind of funny. They realize how much offense you can actually run in 15 seconds. If you get the ball to the floor, you can get the ball reversed a couple times and get a pretty good look at it. 
um, if you're if you're moving. Yeah, I want to dig in there a little bit, you know, because I, I want to distinguish something you said, which is, or an important distinction, which is like when you're when you're playing fast, you know, and you put in secondary break options. You sometimes, you know, we as coaches, we like to be in control. We want to we want to move the chess pieces where. And so you you said it like you got to give up some of that control and allow your players to play free to do that. You have to build trust in, in, in each other. And to do that, you have to give them some concepts to play out of and then trust that they're going to go make the right decision. So decision making is key. Shot selection is key. Um, how that's a, this is a loaded question because uh, I want to come back to that 15 seconds thing in a minute too. Yeah, how are what are the decisions you're teaching? What what is the framework like? What's a good shot in your system? You know, I, I've heard people do that. You know, I, you know, you, you, everybody says, well, we got to have threes and free throws and paint touches. And I don't think we're any different than anybody else. I mean, you don't like the one dribble inside the three pull up. You know, we kind of said that's. You know, I'm I'm not one of those guys that says let's get rid of the post game, let's get rid of the 15 footer. I mean, we got guys who make a lot of 15 footers. <laughs> I mean, it's a good shot for them, so we sh- we shoot it. So I'm not, I honestly don't do that. Um, I guess what I I guess I know what a bad shot looks like. I'm not sure I have a way of saying, hey guys, this is these are the shots we want. Um, the way I approach it to a guy. I don't I, I don't like guys looking over their shoulder and having coaches say, was coach, was that a good shot? Was that a bad shot? The way I approach it to a guy is that when you take if you take that shot that you just took, you're saying to the rest of your teammates, you the only way we can win is if I can make that. And on some teams, that may be true. You you may not have much talent and a guy has to take a bad shot here or there and make them be, to to help to win. That's not us. We, we have, you know, guys, we have more talent than that. And so, you know, Jimmy, when you shoot that shot, you're telling the rest of your teammates, hey, I don't think you guys are good enough to win. And that's not the case. So um, don't shoot that shot because you're, you're disgracing the rest of your guys in your squad. And they're going to do the same thing with you because they know that we all have talent and that we don't need to shoot it. And I guess that's the way I approach it. And I haven't had a big issue. You know, sometimes I have to put a guy in check every now and then just say, you know, stop shooting that shot, but it doesn't happen that often. I think we got an unselfish group and they know, I said, watch what you watch an NBA game and you watch a game or a college game and a guy shoots it and you're like, what the, what the hell was he doing? Well, whenever you think that, that was the shot you just took. So don't do it. And and they're usually pretty good with it. Yeah. And, and one thing I, you know, John, I've been thinking a lot about on the last year is, you know, coaches spend a lot of time building culture, you know, and we want to have this strong culture. And sometimes your culture can be ripped away and torn down by poor shot selection. You get on a team where guys are taking bad shots. That's frustrating. It's frustrating if you're playing pickup ball, let alone in a college basketball or high school game. Um, And so it sounds like you don't even have to do much of the coaching on it. It's a player to player accountability. And that comes organically. Am I fair? Is that fair to say? It does. You know, that guy takes a bad shot. Look, look at the teammates. Do they all look at you as the coach? Do they all kind of look over their shoulder and go, what is he going to let him shoot that shot? And, and what I would say is um, sometimes you have to address it right then, but then sometimes you have to look over at one of the captains like, I'll get this, I'll get it. And, you know, then you bring that guy in or you get him after practice and say, listen, I didn't want to embarrass you in front of the rest of your team. But because but that the, the shots you're taking are not good, and if you want me to do that in front of the group, keep shooting that shot. I'm gonna. This is kind of your warning. I'm talking man to man. Tighten it up because I got guys looking at me wanting to know when I'm gonna fit, fit, uh, get you to stop doing this. And you know it's funny. You know you have to have a relationship with guys to have that conversation. Um, you know, and if they, if they keep shooting it, which I haven't had that issue, if they keep doing it, I'd bench them and put them down. But, you know, uh, I think that that's the thing. And I think our players appreciate that. They're like, OK, he called me over. He didn't rip me in front of my teammates. He didn't call me out. But I better make an adjustment because um, he, he wants me to. And I think that that's the yin and the yang of a relationship. Yeah. And I want to I want to get into the 15 second thing in a second. But 
you sharing that reminds me of a article I read when, when coach K took over the uh, Olympic team, he, he was coaching LeBron and Kobe and all these guys. Well, they were playing some of their preliminaries. I don't know if you read this story, but uh, at one point Kobe was taking like some really bad shots, shots he takes with the Lakers and contested shots. And LeBron came over to coach K and said privately to him, you, you know, in some colorful language, he said, Hey, you better you better check him uh, or this is going to get ugly. And Coach K like took it and I think he slept on it for a day or so. And then he pulled Kobe into the hotel room and got him down on the laptop and showed him some of the shots he was taking and, and said, Kobe, you're playing with the best players in the world. You don't have to take the shots you do at the Lakers. And he showed him clips and Kobe and he was nervous about telling Kobe Bryant this. Coach K was. And then Kobe... Kobe looked at Coach K and he said, gotcha, Coach. <laughs> and it was just like he accepted it and he, he got it, you know. And, um, you know, that takes humility for a player to do that. So just want to add that little to your little snippet to your thing. So let, let's dive into this 15-second thing. Really like this. So the goal, and you'll do this in practice and live scrimmage play, it sounds like. We're trying to get a shot off in 15 seconds. If you don't get it, whistle blows. We go side out or baseline. Um, but that that's really just to say, OK, we're going to run a play now, you know, instead of, hey, go get a shot early in the shot clock. You know, talk to us about that. Yeah, I mean, there's a couple of things there. The number one, there's the emphasizing the transition and getting the ball out, and getting the ball floor. The other thing is, you know, as coaches, we're always trying to find duality in the things that we're doing. And, you know. You can wait till the end of practice and run 10 baseline out of bounds plays at the end and do best to 10 or whatever it is. And the guys, you know, you, you, you know, you get that kind of like, okay, we're standing around now and all that stuff. You get to work on your baseline out of bounds over and over and over again or side out. Or maybe there might be a day where we do full shot clock, then it's 15 15. But then if you don't score in the 15 seconds, maybe you get the ball on the side and there's eight seconds on the clock. So now you're working on. Uh, a low shot clock special special thing, you know. So I think it it kind of like I said, you get a little duality in your uh, in your drill work, and and the guys like it because you know they they know the rule and they know they got to get up. And it's funny it, at first, it's really like, oh, I got to I got to rush, and you're like, guys, you don't have to rush. You just have to get the ball out, and you got to sprint the floor, and then. Um, and then that, and it kind of that leads into our offensive stuff. You know, we do a lot of stuff conceptually. We don't run a lot of plays. We run a lot of actions that we work on in three on three and four on four. And so that's how we get good at um, running, going from transition into a concept on the fly without having to stop it and pull it out and do all that kind of stuff. And that's always a little harder for a high school guy with the no shot clock in Illinois. You know, we get high school guys and they're they're The point guard wants to back it up and set it up and they go, no, 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 we don't, you know, that's not happening. And they got to get a, uh, a feel for, for a little bit of flow. Yeah. You guys average over 80 a game this year and you know, you play really fast. So, this is a two-part question. During season, do you see the opponent wearing down? Um, oftentimes, I mean, if you're a curveball in a fastball league and they're not used to that, I'm imagining, you know, opponents in your league at least, you know, you see them wear down sometime in the second half and you go on a little 12-2 run and next thing you know, that, 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 10 that plus 10 was the difference in the game because you just got out and you got a little, little pace and momentum going. Um, yeah, well, I'll just stop there. Like, is that, is that what happens? You get a little bit of that, you know, you talk about that, like the Bill Rafferty spurtability, you know, sometimes we get some spurts, um, and, and you get going on that. Um, I think the other thing is, uh, in college, a lot of times you play with media timeouts, but in our league, we don't. And so, uh, so, you know, we play nine guys and if you don't have media timeouts and you're just going, that that can that can really help you and, and they can help you on those runs. I, I don't think that helps you at the beginning of the game, but I think it helps you as the game goes on and you get into the second half of a half. I think you can you start to see that. Yeah, and you know, so and also in your system, you said it's positionless. So your five or your four, if they get a rebound, you know, they may push it up the floor and your point guard's filling a lane, right? Yeah, and, and we've been smaller. It's funny, you know, we, we have a you got to play again. It's your personnel. We had a six-five center, 
and a 6'3 four man, which is small for our league. And um, but we led the league in rebounding. So we 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 did get the boards taken care of, but we um, still were able to get it out. But to your point, yeah, we we let we let anybody go. Again, it's it's um, you gotta you you'll rate. Well, I'll rein them in if if it's getting sloppy. But you know we we've had guys that have taken care of the ball. We do a lot of work on our feet and you know our, a lot of passing work. And so I feel like. Like you said, you got to let the guys go a little bit. But if you've done the work on the front end, on the back end, you can kind of let them ride a little bit. And John, looking, you know, studying some of your stats and prepping for this conversation, you guys, you know, average 14 assists a game, 11 turnovers, you know, so you're plus there. And so how do you approach? Because sometimes scoring a lot of points, you know, a big part of that equation is taking care of the basketball. And valuing the ball and this is one that I get a lot of question from coaches about is like all right what how, what do you do in practice you know we put the rack of balls out there and if we turn it over you know then we run out of the balls then we're going to run sprints you know that's kind of an old school way but how do you approach it in your coaching style of getting kids to to buy in or excuse me value the ball without playing fearful and that's there's some great gray area in there. Right. You know, it's sometimes it's not what you say or you do, but what you emphasize. And I think that's been an emphasis for us. Um, you know, we do, we don't do the racquetball. One thing we do do in our practice, um, we do chart uh, fouls and turnovers. Everybody gets one foul and everybody gets one turnover. If you think about it, if you play nine guys and um, everybody turns it over once, you'll be, that'll be pretty good in the game, you know? And so, Every every one over one is is an up and uh, down and back. So at the end of practice, I might say, "Hey Sam, you three turnovers today and two fouls, so you've got three up and backs." You know, and so I think it's it's more of an emphasis thing. You know, if we're doing a four on four drill and it's really a defensive drill, we're really got to get a couple guys out there and they got to get three stops to get off or whatever that is. If your team turns it over. Um, those guys have a lap around the court and, and they got to be back by the time they're up again. You know, and I just think it's that kind of stuff that um, kind of builds on each other. I, I agree with you. I don't want guys playing in fear. You know, I don't want them looking over their shoulder. And, um, you know, the, the other thing is you got to make a differentiation. There's a big difference between a live ball turnover and a and a dead ball turnover. And live ball turnovers at our level turn into two points. And dead ball turnovers, you know, I said, if you throw a ball ahead and it goes over that guy's head and you were trying to hit him for a layup, you know, in transition, it goes out of bounds. You know what? I'll take that one, you know. But if you're driving into traffic and three hands are in there and you're loose with it and they rip you and they go the other way, there's a big difference between those two turnovers. And uh, and so, you know, you, you have to – Talk to your players about about that and, and show them stats. I mean, they're not dumb. They see the stats, you know. Like guys, this is this is how you win and lose the games. And so, I, I, I don't. Again, I, I don't think it's anything like one thing that we do, but I think there's a, a constant emphasis on it. That's a good point about the turnovers. You know, Dick Davenzio, who founded PGC, talks about it in his book, which is like you're going against a pressure defense and you make a back door cut and you try to throw it you know, to, to take pressure off that defense first possession. Maybe it's a bad pass goes out. Like that's a better turnover than a lazy entry pass or the other team's best player has four fouls and you want to go at them to try to get that fifth. And maybe it's a block charge and you get a check. Like, I think that that is a really important one for coaches to hear. I appreciate you sharing that, you know, and, you know, offensively too, how do you saying on this before we go to rebounding, thinking about, how do you drill your, you know, that trans? I call it the transfer from the point of the other team scoring or you get the rebound or you get the steal to getting out. And a lot of players, the point of transfer is very slow. Like it happens and it takes them two seconds to like, oh, and then they run. So I'm interested to hear in your practices how you bring it to life. And before you answer one more final point on that is like, you know, say there's 60 possessions in a game and the other team turns it over 15 times. Well, 
Now they sh- they have 45 shots on basket and they make 50%. So 22 shots, only 22 of those 60 are going to be the ball getting out of the net and entering it from the baseline. Yet, yet a lot of coaches, we, we build our practices where all of our transition is from throwing the ball in bounds when in reality, maybe 50, 60% of the possessions start off of a rebound or a um, turnover. So just curious, dude, how do you, is it more of a drill? Is it uh, you just like to play five on five and emphasize? Maybe it's not an either or and it's both. You know, what's your approach? Yeah, that's a, there's a lot of things there. I mean, uh, I think we do do a lot of five on O. Um, so we kind of layer everything. I mean, we have a four things we kind of say, you know, you have your, what are, what are we going to emphasize? And then you, we talk about um, our vitamins, our, our drill work, our fundamental work. And then we talk about our concepts is our third thing. And then our terminology is our fourth thing. We have a lot of terms for things. So we don't have a lot of plays, but we can, we can talk to our players. I can say, Hey, Sam, you know, on flip, you got to wrap that. And, you know, everybody needs to know what that means so that everybody can be on the same page. So having said that, we do a lot of five on O where we're either taking it out of bounds or we throw it up and we call a guy that's supposed to rebound it, you know, three man, that three man grabs it. Well, now they're going out and they're racing out Well, guys have got to fill spots. And that's how you get guys to be a little bit more positionless. And now we're saying, um, we're going, Hey, flip to wrap five man. And then we throw it up. Five man goes and gets it. Now everybody sprints out. So they have to talk on the fly and they have to be going. And um, I think that that starts to get the wheels going. And, and one thing you got to realize, you know, with this kind of stuff, it, it's messy at first. You know, I had coaches that come in that first week of practice and I'm almost like, I'm going to apologize because this is going to look this awful. You know, you're going to wonder what the hell I'm doing. But, uh, um, you know, but you got to be willing to see the mess and and you know the guys get kind of pissed at first you know they're like you know coach this is you know it's not where i said guys you know this is why we call it practice because it's supposed to be messy right now so that we can get this cleaned up when it's supposed to work and um so you gotta live with that and that you know and then that's how you start putting that together um and, and getting the ball you asked about getting the ball out in, in different spots and you're right there is a lot that's a good point with uh um, there's turnovers and all that kind of stuff. You know, you do you do the stuff where uh, one group one you say, hey, we're going to do two transition or changes uh, in this 10 minute drill. And so guys are coming to dribble off the floor and you blow the whistle. That guy has to drop the ball and the other team gets the ball and they're going the other way. Well, that's a turnover situation where you're going side, going back and forth, which I think coaches have done that before. So um, it's just I think, again, those things that I think the guys get familiar with. No, that's good. And and you mentioned, you know, those four things. I want to ask you briefly about vitamins. What what are your daily vitamins? I uh, do a lot of j- jump stop, you know, jump stop stuff, a lot of pivoting, um, you know, just a lot of, you know, we, we our leagues are pretty physical league, so we do a lot of pad work, you know, a lot of uh, we we throw one handed passes because, you know, there, there's a lot of backdoor opportunities with the pocket pass. And uh, we hit guys with the pads and we got to make that stuff and do a lot of post work, um, do a lot of um, face up stuff because we post up our guards uh, a little bit. Um, so everybody's doing a lot of all that kind of stuff. I, I, what I would what I guess what I've always t- talked to, you know, you do clinics and talk to young coaches and things. Your drill work, your work that you're doing in practice should mimic what your emphasis is. You know, and, and we don't do anything in practice that we don't already address and say this is going to be an emphasis for us. If if we want to do it, it has to become an emphasis. And if that's the case, we got to drop something. And so everybody's different. Some people say three, some people say 10. Right? For us, it's five. We have five things that we want to do on offense and five things we want to do on defense. It changes year to year. And uh, and then everything that we do in, in a practice goes to one of those emphasis. And um, so, you know, as you're building your practices up, you got to start with what we want to see at the end so that you know what, what you're doing. You know, don't do the thing where, Hey, I saw this thing on Twitter and that looked like a pretty good drill. Well, how does it fit into your program? Well, it doesn't, but it looks like, well, then don't do it. If that's, that's not a good use of your time. And so, um, that would be kind of how we get that built up with our fundamentals. And we, we call them vitamins cause you take them every day. Um, but you know, we do, we have a, on our practice plan, you know, you usually say what you're doing minute by minute and all that stuff. 
we have our anywhere from six to eight vitamins on there. And so we keep them on our practice plan. And I just highlight the two or three that we're going to do that day. Um, and so that way you always have it in your mind. Don't forget to do your vitamins. You know, you got to have those and then you're, you're, you're not going to forget to do stuff. Yeah. And that, you know, what you mentioned on the, the clinic thing or the Twitter, TJ and I would often, we were, when we first started coaching, we coached together for two years and we'd go to clinics and you'd see some of these guys that are, you know, these high profile division one or NBA coaches and you love the drill and you're just, you just love that you're learning. So you take back everything and you start experimenting with it in practice because you're still as a young coach trying to figure out what what is my system? What, what are we doing? And so that's the uh, conundrum of a clinic is you, you throw everything at the wall trying to figure out what sticks and what what you like. You mentioned the five and five. Um, what do you know or do you remember your five offensive things from this past year that you emphasized? Yeah, we did. A, if I can remember. Yes, it seems like a long time ago. Um, you know, we do transition pace. We always do our spacing. Uh, we do our conceptual work. Uh, we do everything off of two feet. Um, so when I say that's passing, that's finishing, that's doing a lot of shots in the paint. And then uh, um, and then playing um, what I call physical offense. You know, I, I laugh. Everybody always talks about physicality being a defensive thing. You know, they, they we're going to we're going to guard you and we're going to get into you and we're going to and nobody ever says we're going to beat the hell out of you when we have the ball. And so we're talking about screening, which, you know, there's not a lot of screening these days. You know, there's a lot, we run a five out, but we still, there's times where we want to hit and um, you know, and you're going to go and you're going to go in the lane and we want guys that are going to, you know, without charging, they're going to deliver the blows and they're going to get into a body and they're going to finish stuff off. And I think if you don't make that an emphasis, you're not going to get that. And so, and we're a big, good offensive rebounding team. I mean, we're, we're pretty physical on the glass. And so um, that's been a big emphasis. So those would be our five things um, that we really kind of go to. Okay. Well, was, you mentioned rebounding again. I, I think I think you're passionate about it, so I'm excited for us to dive in. Um, you know, I love asking this question when I'm doing clinics to, to coaches, like, "Hey, when does when does defense start?" And you know, most co it's a bit of a trick question, but most it's like when the other team gets the ball. I, I would say our defense really starts on when we shoot the ball. What our offensive rebounding, you know, coverage is going to be. So let's start there with your philosophy on offensive rebounding. What what's your approach? Sure. I mean, it, and it goes, that goes year to year. Here's the thing I'll tell you flat out. And I give this to the players every year and, and it's funny how it's, I brainwash them. So they, they, it's ingrained in their, in their DNA. But uh, you know, if I did the stat and I did it way back when, when I was an assistant of, of just rebounding margin, not, not anything else, just what the rebounding margin is. And when we won rebounding, we win anywhere between 70 to 80% of our games. Usually it's in that 76 range. And uh, when we lose, it's usually low 20s, uh, lose the rebounding. And that doesn't mean throw your best rebounding team on the floor. That's throw your best team on the floor and get them to rebound. And so I thought, oh, then I thought, you know, hold on. I've done this for a couple of years and maybe this is just our style. Maybe that's, you know, what it is. So I did the whole league. It's the same thing. It, honestly, I've done the whole league for t the last decade. And it pretty much comes out to if you win rebounding, you're going to win 70 some percent of your games. And if you lose it, you're going to win 20 some. And so if, if I'm a young coach, I'm like, well, get my team to rebound. And I mean, it's it sounds so simplistic, but if you get two shots and they get one, you got a pretty good chance at, at winning games. And I know turnovers and all that stuff are part of it, but that's just the stat that we use. And I, I've, I know I, our guys believe in it because there will be guards that come to me at halftime at coach. How many boards do I have? You know, it's not how many points, so I have, you know, how many, you know, and you, you got three. I think they're, I think I had like five that have, you know, and that, and so they've got it in there. And, um, and we do, we chart every four games for us. That's a two week period. Every four games we do rebounds per minute. We post it. Um, it's up there. Um, I mean, it, it's become a big part of, of how we do things. And so, I mean, there's, there's the technique side of things. And then as you're talking about, you have to decide, how many guys you're sending to the glass? Are you sending it by a position? Are you sending it by a guy on the floor? I mean, that's all a, a coaching, um, what your theory is and how you do it. 
Um, there have been times where we've sent three guys to glass. There's times where I said, hey, we have a major advantage at the two-guard spot because we're pretty physical there. We're sending them. And, you know, you'd say, well, that's really going to hurt your transition. Number one, it's a lot harder to run offensive transition when you're taking a ball out of the basket. So if you can score, then that's good. And secondly, probably our staple drill we run is called seven-on-five transition. It's a offensive rebounding drill and getting back in transition. It's a staple drill. We run it probably more than any other drill we do. And and the guys actually like doing it. And um, and so I think we always are working on our defensive transition in conjunction with our offensive rebounding. Well, let's since that's the drill you do more than any other, let's let's unpack it for coaches listening, if you don't mind. Sure. So how does the seven on five drill work? Sure. So, I mean, if you've got more than seven, you they're in these lines, but you put two guys, um, let's say we have a, a white and a baby team. Baby is on the, per- there are five guys on the perimeter and white is on the inside. And then you have two whites in, the, in each corner on the baseline. And so they have seven guys. So it, what we do is it's uh, the coach shoots it up. And let's say you're sending three guys, the offensive glass and two guys back, uh, you know, whatever you want to do. So three babies fly in. The five whites are trying to grab board. If baby grabs a rebound, they get the possession. They're scoring. They, it goes right there. So I tell them, if you get an offensive rebound, you don't have to guard, go defensive transition all, all drill. You know, you grab a board, put it in. And it's actually kind of demoralizing, and, and it's great. I love it because that's what happens in the game. You keep on grabbing offensive rebounds on a team, you know, that is demoralizing to another team as you're putting the ball back in. But let's say now the white gets that that rebound, which happens a lot. White gets it. Before the play started, two, the two guys in the corner have called out who they're coming in for. So they're saying, I'm saying, hey, Sam, I got you. So. White grabs the rebound, and they're going. Now these two guys are sprinting up the floor. So what that allows, what doesn't that what does doesn't allow to happen is baby can't just say, "Hey, I got this guy, and I'm going to run next to him." Because now there's two extra guys out there. No one knows who who who's anybody has. And so that's where now your your guards are back or whoever you have back, and they've got to pick up ball, and guys have got to sprint. And then what we'll do, as I've said, with uh, as you get a little bit as you layer stuff and you get a little bit more be- better at it excuse me, is now you can do the three trips, like we said. So we can do rebound to seven on five transition. Now we say make or miss, we're coming back in 15 seconds on another transition. And then if you're really good, you can say seven on five going back, make or miss the other way. So now they have to scramble one more time on a transition. Now that's like January, February stuff. But that think about all the things you just worked on in that. I mean, you worked on your offensive rebounding. You worked on all your talk in defensive transition. You worked on your transition offense because you only had 15 seconds to get up the floor. And then on those stoppages, you worked on baseline out of bounds. You do that for 15 minutes. The guys are gassed. You add some structure to – you're not just rolling it out and saying, hey, let's just play. You, you got some stuff. And then um, – and the guys like it. It's competitive. I mean, who doesn't like that? You're going up and down. So, sorry, let me, let me interject for a second so just make sure I'm clear. You're you're playing five on five in transition, but the two corner guys, yeah. which were white in your description, you know, if that's Chris and Joe in the corner and they call Sam and John, Sam and John fall out, but we're running. I really like that because it does you can't predetermine and get robotic in terms of okay, I know who I got. It it requires decision making and then to think on a higher right. level. Communication becomes key, which we all know is so important in transition. That's and so you, this is your staple drill. Do you do it to a number of points? Because let me let me highlight another thing I like in it. If the offense gets the putback, the rebound, do they have to get the rebound and the putback, and we stay, or just a rebound? They get the rebound, and they have to. They can have the possession. They can throw it out and run offense or whatever they want to do. If, if they score, now if they grab the board and they throw it out, they run offense and they miss the shot and white gets the rebound. Well, we're running a seven on five the other way. So, you know, you're still staying with that. Um, the way we keep so it's a rebound and a score yeah, stop. and then we stay there yeah. and we're going to shoot it again. Yeah. Is it to a certain point total? Yeah, we'll usually do, I mean, depending, we'll usually do twos and threes, play it to 12. Um, you know, you can give an extra point for an offensive rebound for either team. Um, as you're talking about turnovers, if we are, are having an issue with our turnovers, we may just say, 
um, turnovers are an extra point, um, that sort of thing. So um, nothing crazy. I mean, you can score it any way you like. I think 12 is usually pretty appropriate. Uh, if you're given extra points for rebounds and turnovers, maybe go up to 15. But, uh, um, yeah, it works that way. And the other thing that you can do, um, let's say there's a – special play or for us it would be an action that we want to work on instead of just shooting the ball up at the beginning with the coach you huddle that baby team and say hey you're in flip action and we're going to run a play we're going to run that play every time and you're going to run it so now you work on that one play to start that whole thing so you're going to run flip you shoot the shot now here's the rebounding at seven on five going the other way and so that's another way to Okay, now we just worked on that special and we ran 12 plays because, you know, sometimes we do that stuff and we say, all right, we're going to put one team on defense, one team on offense, and we're going to run this play 12 times. Well, the guys on defense are like, but now you do it in this drill and now all of a sudden you do the exact same thing, but you're actually doing it in a live situation where everybody's going at it. So, you, you, yeah, I like that. So let, let me go back to something we started with. Are you, let me clarify, are you having a, um, within your own season, do you go into the season and say, all right, we're sending three to glass and two back, or is it a personnel thing? So game to game and within a game, the lineup on the floor determines what we're doing. What, what, what was your approach yeah. there? We start with a set thing that we're doing. Here's the one thing I will say, if you, when you're thinking offense rebounding, it's easy to bring a, to take a guy off the glass. It's not easy to get a guy to go hard at it. And so if you're going to err early on, we may say, hey, we're going to send four guys to the offensive glass. And we may, sit, you know, we may go into a game and we may say, hey, this team can run transition and I'm a little scared. So let, uh, let's pull one of these guys off. But like for us, you know, we are three, four and five. You know, and again, this is some people do it by position. Some people are on the floor. They never have to be back. I, I'll tell our four and five man: you never, ever, 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 four years, whatever, don't have to be back. So the ball gets thrown, shot up there. You're flying in. And so what we'll do is we just talk about get to the paint. And so that's a, the way we the reason we do that is in film. Um, you know, ball gets shot up, and I can circle Sam and be like. You know, there's four times that you didn't get to the paint. You weren't even trying, you know, and um, that there's your emphasis on, on where you're going. And by the way, when you're doing that film, you've got to cut some of those great plays and don't just get the guy that always gets the ball. You know, it's real easy to cut the guy that grabbed the offensive rebound and got the put back. Hey, great job. Cut that one, too. But how about when Sam flew in there? And a guy knocked him off and somebody else on the team got a tip out and you say, we got an extra possession and you didn't even touch the ball, but you, how fat hard you flew in there, we got it. And so, you know, you've got that. The other part of the rebounding thing is you, you were talking about when does defense start? People usually think offense ends when the shot goes up. You have to think about your floor balance and who's rebounding and who's where that's part of offense, you know, if you're going to grab offensive rebounds. So, like, we're a big ball reversal team. So, when I said spacing and ball reversals and emphasis, you know, our, it's ingrained in our guys. Guys, if we don't reverse the ball, your guy on defense is a helpline guy. He's got a foot in the paint. You're standing at the three-point line. We shoot it. He's going to get the board, okay, most of the time. But if we swing it and move and guys are going – that guy's now out of shape, and now whenever that ball gets shot, you have a step and you can get on the offensive glass with him. So those things correlate, and so you have to, again, you, you talk to your team about that stuff and you show it to them, you know. You know we score 67% of the time when there's two reversals. We score 40 when there's none. You know, get the ball reversed. So, Yeah, and I like what you point out. It's a process based approach and not an outcome based meaning when you show film and chris has gotten to the paint every time or, or there's been 14 shots that, that he got 14 paint touches now he only got one offensive rebound but you're praising the process of him getting there every time the next game when he gets there 14 times you may get six offensive rebounds um so i i think that's important for coaches that are listening to be aware of and, you know, your your statistic is astounding. 
you know, 70, to, you, you know, you win the rebounding battle 70 to 80% of the time uh, you win. And when you don't win rebounding, you lose. And, you know, Josh Merkel, who, you know, you guys played the national championship, that's, you know, he talks about that a lot with his team. And, and I think, let, let me say another thing too, is we're, you know, coaches, we have coaches at all levels listening. You know, some coaches might be thinking, well, you know, I, we can't crash the glass because this team gets out and run or we're playing Elmhurst and they, they're really good at running. So we better get all four of our guy, four guys back. Well, I know if you're, if John Baines is sitting there and hears the coach say that you got to be licking your chops thinking we don't have to box out. We get clean runouts. We get the run. And so like, sometimes you got to flip it on its head and say, when we crash really hard, they got to buy, expend energy boxing us out. It's not a clean rebound. Now it's not a clean outlet. It's not a clean push out. And so, you know, I, I, I always say it like that, like we're going to crash the glass really hard to slow you down actually. And then we have got to have great effort and relentless effort and how we sprint back on defense. So it, the, re, the reality is it takes great effort to be a championship team, great on the glass, great in transition. And it sounds like, you know, that's similar to your approach. Is that fair? I would agree with that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, every coach has to, you have to coach to your talent, you know, your personality. And I mean, nothing against a team that shoots it and everybody runs back, you know, but you better be a really good defensive rebounding team because you don't want to give up those extra possessions at the other end and to each their own. It's just, uh, I think you got to do what you do and do it really well. Yeah. No, this is great stuff, John. Well, look, you know, you've shared a lot. Appreciate you taking time to, jump on and, um, you know, share your knowledge and wisdom and what's been working well, where can coaches find you? If, uh, if you want them to find you, maybe you don't, but if you want them to find you, where would they find you? And then also just any parting, parting final thoughts, uh, for coaches that are listening. Sure. I, I do. I, I love that you brought up Josh Merkel beating us on the glass in the national championship. <laughs> so, well, I didn't, I didn't say he beat you. He got it. Yeah. It, uh, it uh, no, um, I'm on Twitter. I do a lot of Twitter, you know, being the recruiting. I'm also on Snapchat and TikTok and all the other stuff, but I don't check it that too much. But on Twitter at Baines uh, underscore John. Um, and then, uh, you know, anybody that ever wants to email me, I, I think one of the things uh, uh, I, I try to do, I had a lot of older coaches uh, reach out to me and, and spend time with me. When I was a young coach, you know, right now we have things like you do an awesome job with podcasts and we have Twitter and we have film and all that. Uh, I grew up in a time when you had to call somebody up and they had to be willing to have lunch with you to, to learn anything. And um, I have people email me and call me all the time. And I, I certainly if I have the time, I'd love to help people. So feel free. To, I'm on the website uh, at El on Elmhurst University website and uh, email me if you have any questions and and uh, I always am willing to chat with people. And and I want to say uh, thanks again for for doing this. This is uh, I get so much of this. You know, I uh, whenever I talked with you first about coming on, um, I was sitting in a car listening to a podcast uh, that you guys were running. And and uh, I mean, it, it, it's it's great to learn. And and I think it keeps the the juices flowing and it makes us uh, better coaches. Absolutely. Well, you know, again, John, thanks so much for sharing. And we, you know, we, we love this game and love, you know, having coaches share so freely. And uh, that's how we grow coaches. That's how we grow ourselves. So thank you. That is John Baines. I am Sam Allen. And this is the Hardwood Hustle. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of the Harwood Hustle, where we believe in the value of a coach. We'd also love for you to join us at one of our fall PGC coaching clinics or read and react workshops. We have six locations to choose from. Go to pgcclinics.com for more information. That's pgcclinics.com. From the Harwood Hustle team, thanks again. We can't wait to be with you again next week.